Good afternoon uh, and, and welcome to this uh, Combating Anti-Semitism program that I am proud to host. I'm State Senator Shelley Mayer, Senator from the 37th District. That is sort of what I call half of Westchester. Sound Shore to North Castle and Bedford and the border with Connecticut, basically the eastern half of Westchester County. Uh, I'm very proud to be to be sponsoring this program. Originally scheduled for the night that uh, Ida hit our our community so hard, and I appreciate all our panelists and others for agreeing to reschedule. I was obviously prompted to ensure that we had a conversation about anti-Semitism in our communities, uh, its prevalence, what we have done about it, what we can do about it, and how we can address it. And let me just say as a elected official, as a Jewish elected official, I believe this is an American problem and we need to see it that way. It's not a problem only that Jews are targeted, it is a problem when hate is so prevalent in our communities and exhibited through acts of violence, intimidation, uh, or anything else that really gets at the fabric of our diverse communities. Jews have been very much on the receiving end of anti-Semitism, but it got much worse this year. And Scott is gonna talk about it historically but just looking at the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, tracker of anti-Semitic events in New York this year, just going September 19th in Brooklyn, while walking past the synagogue, a man made threatening comments to blow up the synagogue and told the passerby, kill all Jews. Four days earlier, anti-Semitic gra graffiti was included, Nazis are Israelis. In Woodburn, New York, just north of us, a Hasidic synagogue was vandalized by a driver in a passing car who fired a paintball gun at the synagogue on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And in Northport, New York, in Long Island, August 30th, a swastika was found etched into playground equipment at an elementary school, and a similar incident in August 16th in Ossining. And of course, there were very threatening incidents in New York City uh, against Jews through the summer and the fall. It really caused us, caused me to say, we need to actually talk about how to confront this, how to speak up about it, how to find effective solutions, and how to ensure that we reduce anti-Semitism and make it clear that it's absolutely unacceptable. Um, I did want to point out that I am chair of the Senate Education Committee, and I believe we have a, a challenge in front of us to educate young people about anti-Semitism and all forms of hate, and we have not done that well enough. You know, the New York State Education Law specifically says that students must be taught about our shared history of diversity, the role of religious tolerance, particular attention to the inhumanity of genocide, slavery, including the Freedom Trail and the Underground Railroad, the Holocaust, and a few other pretty terrible incidents. And they must be taught in school. We're not convinced that these issues are taught or are taught effectively in every grade. And I know for myself and my colleagues, we're gonna focus this year on ensuring that education about intolerance, hatred and anti-Semitism is part of the conversation in schools so that students are educated at an early level. And I would also add, as someone who comes from Yonkers and has been present in the Yonkers public schools when Holocaust survivors spoke to our young students who had, who had no exposure to Jews and knew nothing about anti-Semitism, the personal connection of hearing a story was in, in itself an educational moment of great value. And there's room to do more of that. So before a generation leaves us and dies out, we must make sure that those stories, the real stories of young people who were young during those days are told to the next generation. 
that's one of the things I feel very strongly about. We have a very distinguished panel and I'm very, very appreciative. They've all shared their time and their experience. First, we have Scott Richman, who serves as a director for ADL's largest regional office covering New York and New Jersey. He oversees the work of the region, which includes incident response, anti-bias education, legislative initiatives, educational programs, fundraising and leadership development, all designed to fight anti-Semitism and combat hate in all its forms. And I think that Scott will make clear, ADL has made combating hate a centerpiece in their efforts. They've been among the leaders in ensuring that we have a robust anti-hatred conversation at all levels. Uh, I worked closely with Scott when he was at the American Jewish Committee as regional director for Westchester and Fairfield counties. He's an exceptional, uh, thoughtful, and persuasive leader on the issues of anti-Semitism and hate in our country and in our region. So he'll be speaking first. Secondly, we have Tejas Sanchala, Executive Director of the Westchester County Human Rights Commission, who also has an extraordinary record of leadership in our county under County Executive George Latimer. He has more than 15 years of legal experience He's an accomplished lawyer, but beyond that, he's brought to the County Human Rights Commission a renewed sense of urgency to the work that we have to do and to ensure that Westchester is in the leadership in taking on anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred, which sadly, we are not exempt from here in Westchester. Um, he was a commissioner and now he is the chair uh, his, under his leadership, the Human Rights Commission has been extremely aggressive and forward thinking about ensuring from every part of our county, from Yonkers and Mount Vernon to Bedford and Curdies, everyone must be included in this conversation. Tejas, thank you for your leadership on that. And last but certainly not least, uh, an extraordinary district attorney who has really uh, modernized and taken the DA's office in Westchester to a new level uh, Mimi Roca, who was elected in November 2020 after running a grassroots campaign centered on an aggressive platform for reforming and modernizing the DA's office. Previously, DA Roca serves as an, served as an assistant U.S. attorney from 2001 to 2017 in the Southern District of New York, where she oversaw the prosecution of organized crime, gun traffickers, corrupt public officials, narcotics dealers, sex traffickers, and child predators. She received the 2016 Women in Federal Law Enforcement Leadership Award. Then 2012, under President Obama, she was promoted by U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara to, to Chief of the Westchester Division for the Department of Justice. In that position, she served as primary liaison with law enforcement agencies and other prosecutorial offices, including the DA's office and coordinated and co-chaired the multi-county task forces on specific issues such as human trafficking and opioid overdose epidemic. She has a distinguished legal career and many of you know her, but I would just say as someone who does know her leadership, she has been extremely outspoken on hate crimes, anti-Semitism, and this tearing at the fabric of American diversity and civil discourse which should be, really is, is not to my satisfaction. Um, DA Roca has been really in her short term in office already really modernized and changed the look and the direction as well as the work of the DA's office. She brings her own perspective as a career prosecutor. So thank you very much. With that, I think we'll turn it over to Scott uh, to give us your perspective on anti-Semitism in the context and the evidence of, of what, what we can and should do. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Mayor, and uh, really honored to be on the panel with uh, DA Roca and Tejas. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we're, we're having this discussion on a very auspicious day. I spent the morning at the Museum of the Jewish Heritage uh, because Governor Hochul announced uh, very important new grants for protecting Jewish institutions. Uh, pretty amazing that uh, in just the first few weeks of, uh, of assuming this, she, she's 
uh, muster the forces to be able to provide these kinds of grants. It says something, of course, about Governor Hochul and her commitment to fighting hate, but it also says something about the time that we're living in and the fear within the Jewish community about anti-Semitism and the, the rise in anti-Semitism uh, really in, in just the past few months, but it's, it's not just the past few months. Uh, you know, this is, this is something that's been going on for much longer than that. Uh, you know, if I think of even my own personal background, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. And when I was growing up, I never thought about anti-Semitism. It, it was not something that was really present. It was not like my parents. You know, my parents' generation, they, there were restrictions for going to country clubs. They were not allowed into corporate suites. Uh, uh, they, um, uh, there were quotas uh, in universities for Jews. That was gone. And it was just a very, very different time. But starting around 2010, 2011, 2012, we began to see an uptick. And uh, I should talk about the fact that ADL, uh, my organization, is um, among the things that we do, we provide the quantitative information. And the reason we provide the quantitative information about anti-Semitic incidents is because that is what we are doing every day. We're responding to anti-Semitic incidents. So since 1979, ADL has been putting out an audit of anti-Semitic incidents, um, sorry, um, an audit of anti-Semitic incidents. And that audit is not a survey. It's not going out and saying, have you experienced anti-Semitism? Are you concerned about anti-Semitism? We certainly do that, but it's actually a reflection of the work we're doing every day. Part of the work of my staff is to reach out to victims to reach out to law enforcement, to government officials, faith leaders, and work with them on responding to anti-Semitic incidents. In my office, which is New York and New Jersey, we get about 30 incidents a week reported to us. It's a lot to follow up on, uh, very significant. Not all of them are ultimately declared to be anti-Semitism. We're very, very careful about what we, uh, what we say is actually anti-Semitic. So it's a big piece of our work. And, it, and uh, every spring we compile that and we say, these are the figures from the year before. So we're really comparing apples and apples. Um, in 2013, we recorded about 1000 anti-Semitic incidents across the country. In 2020, that was over 2000 incidents. So that's just to give you a sense, it has doubled in those seven years. Uh, there has been a, a marked, marked increase in anti-Semitic incidents. Now, if I talk about the 2020 numbers, it's very important to focus on the fact that this was a year of physical distancing, of lockdowns. You would expect the numbers to go down considerably. And 2019 was the highest year we'd ever recorded. In 40 years, it was the highest year we ever recorded. 2020 was almost that high, and it was higher than 2018, higher than 2017, higher than 2016, et cetera. So it, we're talking about significant numbers. Now, why is that the case? It's because anti-Semitism morphs. It morphs, we've seen that, it's always morphed throughout thousands of years of history, it's found a way. And once again, it found a way while we were in lockdown and that was through social media, it, it became virtual. So uh, attacks on Jewish institutions were up considerably in 2020. Why? Because of Zoom bombing. Uh, so very, very significant. Now, uh, that's 2020. In 2021, uh, we saw the, the, the uh, anti-Semitism in the wake of the Israel-Hamas conflict. Very, very significant. Obviously, we don't have all of those numbers yet, but uh, I think uh, I don't have to tell this audience. Everybody saw it. Uh, on the front page of their newspapers. Uh, we uh, saw a 75% increase in the month of May over the year before in anti-Semitic incidents. And many of them were quite brazen, such as the examples that you gave. Uh, now, one thing I wanna mention um, is that, you know, there are incidents that occur that while they impact the Jewish community and are scary for the Jewish community, they're really impacting all. And the reality is, and, and it's, it's what you were saying before, we need to fight all forms of hate. That's always what ADL has done um, because hate impacts all of us. And if you tolerate one form of hate, you're tolerating all forms of hate. 
And what I'm talking about here is white supremacist propaganda. I wanna point this out. I think it's very important for this conversation. So uh, ADL has been tracking this phenomenon of white supremacist propaganda, which unfortunately has hit Westchester multiple times uh, in the past year. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about stickering and flyering. These are particularly heinous where white supremacist groups like the Patriot Front, like the New Jersey European Heritage Association, come and put stickers and flyers uh, throughout a town. And one incident could involve 200 flyers, uh, really particularly heinous. And you know, this is something that uh, is, is uh, uh, terrible for all marginalized communities. I mean, if you think about uh, a flyer that was put up last year at Christmas time, have a very white Christmas. That, that, is, that impacts all marginalized groups. Now, um, if I give you the numbers, I think it's particularly shocking. In 2017, there were uh, approximately 12 incidents of white supremacist propaganda in New York State. In 2020, just three years later, four years later, we're talking about over 300 incidents. White supremacists have found that this has been successful. They've found it's been successful for giving them visibility. They found it's been successful for recruiting. Uh, and unfortunately, I think they felt uh, particularly emboldened over the past few years. So there's the issue of anti-Semitism, but it extends far beyond that. Uh, I know my time is limited and we'll, we'll probably get into lots of other things, but I don't only want to talk about the problem. I want to talk a little bit about the solution. There are many solutions that ADL offers uh, through our Center on Extremism, our Center for Technology and Society, which deals with digital hate, our work in Washington, legislative initiatives, all of these different pieces. But there's one in particular that I want to talk about and that everybody who's listening can help with and that has been uh, particularly effective in Westchester, and that's our No Place for Hate program. So No Place for Hate is uh, an initiative that was started years ago where we galvanize a community to engage in activities to fight hate. So we, it, it's through the schools. We pull together parents and teachers, administrators and students, form a group of people who will, uh, who will work together with ADL to put together activities which will be customized for the school over the course of the school year. And if they do enough, and if it meets the requirements, they get a, a, a sort of accreditation from ADL, a big No Place for Hate banner. And this is a program that we've been doing for years. And for the most part, it, it, uh, it took the form of schools that were experiencing some sort of incident, like they would have a swastika in the school, and they wanted a constructive response. So they'd reach out to ADL and the following year they'd go through the No Place for Hate program. And, and that happened in many schools in Westchester. I'm here to report that that is not the case anymore. This program uh, has now sort of come into its own. There are so many schools that are coming to us. We just passed the 250 school mark in New York and New Jersey, that's my office. Um, and that's really, really extraordinary. Uh, and we're probably gonna cap it at 300 schools. If anybody is looking for a very constructive way to deal with these issues in the schools, where it comes very much, it's very organic. It comes from within the school and they, they construct it in whatever way they want. And the idea is it's a whole of school approach and it can be, um, it can be middle schoolers, it can be elementary school, it can be high school. We actually kicked this off nationwide today uh, because it's a, it's a year-long program with Amanda Gorman. So Amanda Gorman, uh, you may recall, she was the, the young woman, the, the Harvard student who read the poem at President Biden's inauguration. Uh, she's very taken with the program. And uh, she, she not only spoke about the program, the importance of fighting hate, but then she answered questions from students uh, about her thoughts about fighting hate today. Uh, so a uh, particularly auspicious day, I would say, to be having this panel. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it back to, uh, to Senator Mayer. Thank you so much, Scott. And thank you for 
not only talking about the challenges, but the solutions. One of the many, as you said, there are many more solutions and we'll get to them uh, when we, when we, if we hear from everyone, but thank you so much. Now we're, we'll turn it to Tejish Sanchala to talk about what we're doing here in the county from the county executive and the human rights commission's perspective. And thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to your you're, you're very, as I say, forward-looking and activist uh, style of uh, engaging on this issue. Thank you so much, Senator Mayor. Um, I think this is an important discussion. I'm glad we were able to reschedule and have it today. And just want to say thank you to Scott for such an informative presentation and for all the work that ADL is doing in, in fighting hate. There are many schools that I go into and I see that banner, uh, no place for hate school. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and share a couple of uh, PowerPoints, and I'll talk a little bit about what the county's been doing. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. So it's just a cover page um, at this point. I'm just going to talk a little briefly about what the Human Rights Commission, which is now in its 21st year, is doing to fight hate and discrimination in the county. We are very fortunate as County Executive Latimer has been a champion of the Human Rights Commission since its inception in 2000, when he was a county legislator, along with then legislators, Andrea Stewart Cousins and the late Lois Bronze. I bring you greetings from the commission's board, which is chaired by Reverend Doris K. Dalton and Reverend Dr. Stephen Pogue. Some of you may also know the board's committee co-chairs, Jennifer Bernard and Gary Tracton. We often talk about the damage of anti-Semitism and other forms of hate extend out well past the moment of an act, um, whether it's being a swastika drawn somewhere or some other um, hate incident. It's felt much more than just the individual who's targeted. The damage and the pain extends to the community in the silence that follows, in the feelings that are not validated, and in the story that never gets told. Sometimes the instances of hate and discrimination are overt and it's easy to see, but we have to be vigilant not, not to overlook the covert and subtle forms of hate and discrimination. And here at the commission, we focus on combating overt and covert acts of hate and discrimination. Let's see, okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about the commission's jurisdiction. The Human Rights Commission enforces the county's human rights law and the county's fair housing law and educates the public about their rights and obligations under these laws. The county's laws prohibit discrimination based on 17 protected categories, including religion. That means actual religion and perceived religion as well in four main areas, employment, housing, places of public accommodation, and credit lending. Religious discrimination like anti-Semitism can infer, appear in many forms like the insidious comments at the dinner table, at school, or a legally actionable claim at work. I'm gonna give you three examples of religious discrimination under the county's human rights laws so that you're aware of it. One, if an employer has a no head covering policy, for an example, an employee may ask for a reasonable accommodation to wear their kippah. Uh, indeed, a case recently went to the US Supreme Court about an employee's right to wear a hijab in the workplace. An employee may also be able to file a complaint with the commission if they're subject to anti-Semitic comments in the workplace. Similarly, if an apartment building has a rule against affixing anything to a unit's outer doorpost, a Jewish tenant may request a reasonable accommodation of that rule to place a mezuzah outside their door. If the housing provider denies that request, that could keep an observant Jewish person from occupying that unit. And that could, form, that could form the basis of a housing discrimination complaint with the commission. Now, reasonable accommodation can also occur in places of public accommodation, like a doctor's office, a restaurant. And I wanna talk about a particular incident that happened in upstate New York at the beginning of the pandemic. That's just illustrative of the type of COVID-19 related discrimination we saw across the country. Employees in one car dealership allegedly denied service to a man wearing a yarmulke and who was dressed in traditional Hasidic garb. Employees told him the service center was closed and to go away because he was quote unquote spreading the virus. There were videos on social media that showed uh, that appeared to support the allegations the man was denied service based on stereotypes and tropes about the Jewish community. At the commission, we championed the message that viruses don't discriminate and neither should we. It's been reported that 15% of Jewish adults in the United States under 30 are Hispanic, Black, Asian, or other non-white races are multiracial. The intersectionality of those identities, say a Black Jewish woman, 
can present discrimination on multiple layered bases. So I would like to talk about a timely initiative at the commission. The county executive proposed an amendment to the human rights law to expand its jurisdictional scope. The board of legislators passed the amendment and the county executive scheduled to sign the bill this Friday. Currently complaints to the commission need a nexus to one of those areas I talked about, employment, housing, place of public domination, credit lending. Under this new amendment, the commission would be able to accept, investigate and adjudicate complaints based on street harassment, neighbor on neighbor harassment, among others. The provision reads, it shall, be an unlaw it shall be unlawful discriminatory harassment for a person to, if by force or threat of force, knowingly injure, intimidate or interfere with or threaten any other person in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege when such actions are motivated in whole or in part by a person's actual or perceived protected status. That would include one of the 17 categories that's protected under the county's human rights law presently. It's important to note that under this provision, the alleged conduct has to be more than words. It's words plus conduct. This is a timely and proactive approach to combating discriminatory harassment in our county. It goes beyond the avenues that are currently protected under the human rights law. It goes beyond what New York State's human rights law provides, and the county is happy to be a leader in this regard. When the Board of Legislators was considering the county executive's proposal, many community members spoke out in support of this provision, including Bill Schrag of the WJC and members of the county's LGBTQ, Asian American and Arab American advisory boards. So aside from our investigatory mandate at the commission, the commission also educates the public on the laws that we enforce and on hate and discrimination in general. To this end, the commission launched an education and empowerment series in 2020. This slide shows some of the programs that we did in the past year or so. I wanna discuss a few that might be relevant for tonight's program. Our chair, Reverend Dalton, and vice chair, Reverend Dr. Stephen Pogue, each moderated a discussion with interfaith communities on the film Shared Legacies. The film showed about the historical parallels in the struggles between the black and the Jewish communities and their solidarity. It talked about some of the things that Scott talked about in the 1950s and 60s, where there were signs that said, no blacks, no Jews. Uh, at, at a particular hotel in Miami was one of the scenes. The commission recently held an in-person solidarity building workshop with different community groups. We expect to announce additional workshops very soon. We are going to be participating in an interfaith uh, dialogue later this month. And all of these programs are part of our ongoing efforts to build bridges within the community. Some of the other programs that we did that were very successful were bystander intervention training workshops to help build a community of upstanders. The programs were customized and included a scenario involving anti-Semitism. The programs are designed to empower participants to stand up for each other against hate and to make our community more safe and inclusive. Being an upstander takes practice and workshops like these allow us to practice our techniques safely so we're empowered to take action when the need arises. Whenever I do one of these programs, I always learn a new tip and how I can best stand up for somebody in our community, whether it's at the grocery store line, on the street, or in, even in a, in a place of employment. We hope to have two or three more of these workshops later this year, and, uh, and I will let uh, Shelly's office know about the next programs. In partnership with the American Group Psychotherapy Association, the commission held a workshop on the emotional impact of hate and racism. In small group settings, we provided a safe and inclusive space to share and receive people's experiences with discrimination. It was really eye-opening for some people. Many participants bravely shared their painful experiences and they described the indelible mark that hate left on them, their core identity and their family. In the small group that I participated in, one member spoke about being a victim of anti-Jewish hate at the hands of a trusted professional. The American Group Psychotherapy Association and Dr. Leo Lederman uh, were kind enough to provide pro bono post-event counseling sessions to the members who were impacted by hate and racism. We also have the program on how to have productive conversations on race and discrimination with your friends and family. I think that is a skill that has been lost uh, in today's um, climate, but it's important to remember, it's likely many of us will be able to make the greatest impact on combating hate by having these difficult conversations with people closest to us. 
And I'm reminded of the story of Derek Black, who was born into the preeminent white nationalist family, and it was the godson of David Duke. And Derek's journey from a white nationalist to an anti-racist is revealing, but it's important to remember that he credits the college classmates that he had, um, who bravely refused to stop having difficult conversations with him, Matthew Stevenson and Allison Bornick. Um, he wouldn't have been able to make his journey without them. So I often think of how can somebody in our community be a Matthew Stevenson or an Allison Bornick. Um, these skills and this perspective is especially important now when a lot of the collective impulse is to shout down and to disengage from having a civil discourse. Last, to touch a little bit about what Scott said as well, we also presented on hate symbols and recruitment status by hate groups, and we talked about the dangers of Holocaust denial. Okay, here's my last slide. And I know the district attorney is gonna to speak to you about hate crimes, but I wanna share a couple of tips about responding to hate incidents. Hate incidents are those acts that may not rise to the level of a crime, but they're important to report and to speak out against. For example, calling someone an anti-Semitic slur on the street may not rise to the level of a crime, but it would be a hate incident. The US Commission on Civil Rights has stated that hate is significantly underreported. And history has shown that a pattern of unreported hate incidents can create an environment that breeds potential hate crimes. Scott and the ADL often talk about the pyramid of hate and how hate can escalate within a community if it remains unchecked. So I wanna just talk a couple of tips because I've, I've been speaking to some people in the community and, and I think this is important. If you see stickering or destruction of property in the community, contact the police. It's important to note you should not remove or alter the offensive materials. It could negatively impact the potential investigation. And I can't stress the next point more strongly. Do not promote the hate group's offensive materials. A couple of people have shared with me and said, contagious, I like to share the materials for shock and awe effect. And, um, but that's really harmful for multiple reasons. One, the imagery, the imagery can be triggering for some. And two, you're giving the perpetrators the very publicity that they're seeking. These are generally acts of cowardice. And finally, um, in the bystander training workshops we do, we talk about recording incidents or taking notes of the specific words. In hate crimes and hate incidents, the specific words matter. And we talk about doing so only if it's safe to do so. Um, the last point I wanna talk about is if you remember one thing and only one thing from what I talked about today or this program, let it be this. If you see an anti-Semitic incident or any hate incident, the most important thing you can do is to report it. Whether that's to the ADL, to the Human Rights Commission, to the District Attorney's Office, uh, it's important that we capture and understand the incidents that are happening in our community. If it's a crime, contact the local police department. If it's an emergency, contact 911. You can report hate incidents to the Human Rights Commission and to the District Attorney's Office. We've created an online reporting tool where you can create a hate incident online anonymously. Uh, we can we contact you and follow up if you leave your contact information. We do not ask about an individual's immigration status uh, under the, again, the Immigrant Protection Act. So I wanted to share those tips with you today in my short time and uh, look forward to our conversation today. I'm already feeling slightly more hopeful because each of you has put some solutions and uh, positive ways to respond on the table. Not that they don't provoke additional questions, which I had and I will ask, but you've talked about ways to speak up and uh, fight back and report. And really your strategies are so important and thank you for sharing. I next turn to DA Mimi Roca to talk a little bit about her office and their response to these incidents and in general to anti-Semitism and hate. Thank you, um, Shelley. It's, um, I'm, I'm honored too to be part of this um, seminar panel. Um, and I've, I've been on before with both Scott and Tejash, and um, I learn something new every time I hear them speak. So it's, it's really um, wonderful. And um, I feel really lucky to live in a county where there's so many people like you, Senator, um, addressing and taking on proactively and, and thinking about this issue. Um, you know, I think Westchester is a, a very inclusive place and 
um, the, those of us who are inclusive out, outnumber those who aren't. And so we're, um, we're, we're coming up with ways to, to combat it all the time. Um, this is an issue that is obviously important to me as um, uh, someone in law enforcement. It always has been, and it's important to me personally, like many of probably the people listening, my father and his parents um, were Holocaust survivors and escaped uh, the Nazis in Romania while some of my family members perished. I, um, it's funny, Scott, when you said that in the 70s and 80s, you know, there, there wasn't as much anti-Semitism, and that's true, but I do have this very distinct memory. I went to a, a Jewish day school growing up in Chicago, and we would regularly have bomb threats and have to go sit out in the um, outside, you know, a certain distance away from uh, the building. And um, I don't remember feeling scared, but I remember feeling knowing we all just were very aware of the fact that this was happening because we were Jewish and that's why we were getting those threats. So it's something that I'm very aware of. It's something that all of our um, our children, you know, are encountering um, on social media, as we've been talking about. Um, and, you know, the rise in extremism and in uh, social media are two of the main the main drivers of, of what we're talking about here today and we have to just recognize that that's not to uh, penalize or target you know any particular uh, area but that's just a fact um, I know you know we're talking a lot about numbers and statistics as Scott did and I, I try to look to data for everything um, unfortunately, the FBI released its hate crime statistics for 2020, and they were both good and bad. Um, overall, anti-Jewish crimes did um, significantly actually decrease from the record highs that Scott mentioned of 2019, but there were still 676 reported crimes against a Jewish victim in 2020. Um, and hate crimes in the United States overall rose more than 6% in 2020 to their highest levels in more than a decade. Um, and this is a not in a good way, but interesting statistic that of all the hate crimes motivated by religion, more than half targeted a Jewish victim, which is a very um, startling statistic since Jews make up such a small percentage of the US population. Um, and of course, these are numbers, but the things we're talking about are very human and real. And um, I think we have been fortunate here in um, Westchester to, to not see um, that, that my office has, has not received, at least in terms of reporting, a spike in numbers. But, but any one that happens creates um, a feeling, an environment of fear where people feel unsafe. But I think it also creates an opportunity for um, those of us in law enforcement to show the very positive side of law enforcement to help support victims and families and communities and help build trust. Um, and I think that all boils down to how we respond, whether it's a, you know, obviously a violent incident, um, you know, we we address um, in, in a very um, serious way, always. I think traditionally law enforcement has, and this is this is just a matter of you know the priorities um, and and having you know a, a large volume um, when there were hate and bias incidents that didn't at least obviously rise to the level of a crime. I think that. Um, communities sometimes felt that those weren't given the same seriousness uh, attention. Um, that doesn't mean every time, but I think overall, you know, around the country. And so that's something I think that we can do and change in law enforcement um, in terms of our response. And I, I do see that here, here in Westchester. Um, you know, acts of hate and hate crimes are not necessarily the same thing. And I know that can be a really hard thing for communities to accept um, and understand. Um, the law can be very technical. And so hate crimes are some of the hardest um, crimes that we as prosecutors um, face in terms of um, how, to, how to get enough evidence to prosecute them. Not only 
do you need what you need in every crime, which is evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that a crime occurred and it was committed by a certain person. But in these kinds of cases, we also have to demonstrate that the perpetrator intentionally selected or intentionally committed the act because of a belief or perception about someone's race, gender, religion, um, something in a protected class. That's sort of a heightened element of intent and it exists in very few areas of criminal law. It's not wrong that it exists here, but it is part of what can make um, the challenge. So for example, um, if there's evidence that someone shouted a racial slur while committing an attack, that would obviously be um, proof of something being motivated by hate. But of course, most or many things that happen that are horrible and that a victim um, can feel, a victim in one of the protected classes I just mentioned, can feel that they were targeted in that way because of who they are or because of um, one of these uh, characteristics. Um, the evidence of showing that and proving that usually isn't as straightforward, not always, I mean, it can be, but not always as straightforward as someone actually saying it. And so we have to be able to show that the perpetrators, you know, bigoted beliefs motivated their conduct through something much more indirect, circumstantial evidence. And this is hard to do, but of course it is our job to try and do it. And it is something that I and the prosecutors in my office and the police that I work with um, consider a top priority. And these are the cases where, you know, there's some cases where you have to be more persistent, more dedicated, more aggressive um, than in others. Um, and I think this is one of those areas because we know they're hard to prove, but we also know how damaging and important they are not just to individuals, but to entire communities. Um, just a few of the other sort of maybe not as traditional prosecutorial things that we're doing in our office um, to try and address more proactively um, and work on community outreach and prevention. Um, we have a hate and bias crime coordinator who um, has spoken with many community groups across the county and she's fabulous. Um, I was very proud to appoint her, Catalina Blanca Vitrago. Um, she just, she pours her heart and soul into this and really cares about it. And it shows um, with the county executive and the Human Rights Commission, we launched the Speak Up Westchester um, campaign. And um, I think Tijash referenced it earlier. It really is about trying to get people to speak out, even if they see something small, um, if you're a victim of it or if you're a witness to it, um, every incident, as, as we've all said, big or small, we want to be um, captured in some way. Um, it, 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 it helps in the sort of big picture overall prevention and addressing. Um, we launched a multilingual hotline, 914-995-TIPS, which is available 24 hours a day in different languages. Um, and it's another option for reporting these crimes and incidents. Emergencies, I always say, you know, you should call 911 or the police department if it's an urgent, you know, immediate situation. Um, this is more for helping us um, get tips to launch more long-term investigations um, we also have changed our complaint form, which is much more accessible and available in different languages online, so people can more easily report these incidents. Um, and just a couple of other tips that I will give um, to echo, um, I think, it, I'm sorry, I don't remember now if Tejosh or Scott said it or both, that when someone receives, for example, an email that they consider to be um, hateful. Um, instead of just forwarding it to law enforcement, it actually is better to call law enforcement and have them come and retrieve it uh, on their own because the forwarding itself, we can lose some of the data um, that is useful for tracing it back. Um, I'd rather they forward it than not do anything at all, but I'd rather they call and allow law enforcement to come and retrieve it themselves. Um, security cameras, um, which a lot of places of worship um, have, 
Um, you know, we, we need to make sure that they're actually working um, because, you know, if something does happen, which of course we don't want it to happen, but if it does, we want to be able to use the security footage. And a lot of times, um, and this is true with crimes of many kinds, something happens, there's a camera, but it wasn't working. Um, so those are just things that from a law enforcement perspective, we would, we would really like people to uh, pay attention to and, and spread the word on. Um, and, you know, I, I agree so much with what um, Sunner said, at, what you said at the beginning about this, you know, it's, it's not just about anti-Semitism, it's about um, hate. And if, if really we all sort of bonded together um, in all areas and all people who are affected by hate and discrimination, we're a much more powerful force. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for for all of you for such very concrete uh, points and suggestions. There are some questions, but I, I know I have one that, which is uh, how do you deal with social media, anti-Semitism and social media? I know Scott and I have talked about this and someone here has you know, criticized us for putting this on Facebook, which has been known to spread hate, but it, it's, it's a tool for reaching people and, um, we're hopeful that people use it in that positive way. But Scott and, and, and Mimi, um, Mimi as well and Tejash, how, how do you recommend that people deal with things on social media? For, for example, just very practically, you know, I write, I post a picture, I went to, uh, you know, I had Passover with my family and I show the whole picture and I post that because I'm so overjoyed to have my children and grandchildren and a beautiful picture of a beautiful thing. And that could happen to someone who, you know, goes to church and posts a lovely picture of a communion or christening. And then someone writes just as a comment. It's not a crime, I would suspect, as the DA would say, but it's a hate incident, something that is overtly either anti-Semitic or anti whatever the faith may be or racist. But in this context, we're talking about anti-Semitism. Scott, and, and uh, Mimi and Tejas too. What do you recommend? Should you just ignore it when you say to be an upstander? Should you, what should you do? So uh, maybe I'll jump in here because uh, ADL has a lot of experience with this. I mentioned before our Center for Technology and Society. Uh, this is something that ADL started in 2017 as we saw the, the rise of hate online. They're specifically focused on, on fighting hate in digital spaces. This is not, it's not composed of Jewish professionals like me. Uh, these are, it, it's based in Silicon Valley. There are 12 professionals who are, who are engineers. They, they've come from these companies. They've come from Facebook. They've come from Reddit. They've come from Twitter. And their job is to, uh, to understand the technology, to understand the algorithms, also to be able to reach out to the companies. They meet regularly with these companies because they have those contacts. So very important. And you know, in terms of uh, uh, reporting incidents, that's a piece of the way that ADL responds. So one thing you can do, of course, is report any incidents on social media to ADL. But the second thing, and I think people really don't realize the power that they have, uh, all of these social media platforms have a way to report hate. So, uh, you know, if you see hate, if you see misinformation, it doesn't even need to be hate, it can be misinformation. There are mechanisms for reporting that. For example, on Facebook, there are three dots. And if you click on the three dots, you can click on report and you can, uh, you can send a, a quick notice to, uh, to Facebook about it. They're going to investigate it, hopefully, and they're going to follow up on this. Nobody wants their account suspended. And if they realize that somebody is looking, if they realize that somebody may report them, that has a huge impact. And I think many of us look at social media, we rail against it, you know, we, we, we scream at the computer or we scream at our phone, but we don't actually take that next step. ADL has put out something called the Cyber Action Safety Guide. So if you just Google ADL Cyber Action Safety Guide, you're going to come up with a PDF. That PDF has 20 of the top, top tech companies and next to the name of each, like Facebook, it has two links. One link is their policies, and the second link is how to report a violation of those policies. Very easy way for you to know what to do. And if you're not getting satisfaction, go to adl.org forward slash report, 
You can fill out a very quick form and say, I had this happen to me on social media. I'm, I'm upset about it. They're not responding. Here's a screenshot of what I submitted and we will follow up with those companies. That's what our Center of Technology and Society does. Thank you. Um, I, I have. Can I jump into another question for um, the DA and Tejas? One is about sort of the mandatory reporting. Tejas, this was a question for you from someone. For example, if an incident occurs, I think the question was, uh, for example, in a school or elsewhere, and a teacher hears or sees it. I don't believe there's currently a mandatory reporting uh, requirement. Uh, teachers generally try to deal with this the best they can. Uh, but are you aware of any mandatory reporting by, by teachers or school staff if it doesn't rise to the level of a crime? And this is an important point the DA made and, and she made it in a way that I think is, is easy to understand. It can be a hateful incident and not a crime. And yet the DA said, and I think I just wanna stress this, the police are much more sensitive and responsive than they were traditionally on these incidents. And I think in, in part um, because Tejas and the county executive and you, the DA and others have, have ensured that people wanna feel they can call someone who's gonna do something. And sometimes the police can do something, even if just to go and, and tell someone to back off. And that may be what you need. But Tejas, what do you do are there some mandatory reporting? Should we think about that as something legislatively to consider going forward, even though it has, it's complicated because of the First Amendment issues involved with speech? You know, that, that is a interesting question, Shelley. And I think maybe Scott might have the best background to answer that with his work with the No Place for Hate. But I would mention that every school has the DASA officer, uh, the Dignity for Students Act. Yes. So that, that's the individual that I would suggest to contact and to speak about. And just to add one last point about the previous question you had, we are going to be doing a bystander intervention training workshop later this fall on online abuse. So to that specific. Oh, great. Great. I, I think that. Um, Mimi, do you want to enter, add anything? I thought this police, for many of our older Jewish residents in Westchester who have unease, but they don't quite know what to do with it. You know, if they're concerned, particularly if they dress in a traditionally Jewish observant way, um, I, I want to reassure them that the police are a place they can call if they have, uh, uh, you know, if they're uncomfortable or made to feel uncomfortable. And so, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think I think that's right. And and look, I mean that. The, another alternative, though, if they can call it the Human Rights Commission, they, they can also call our office and um, we will we will have an uh, investigator um, follow up, you know, with them. I mean, we 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 review all those calls that come in and we actually um, return them. Um, you know, it's um, I mean, this is sort of a combined answer to the last two questions, but. The social media piece of it is is hard on on many levels, obviously. Um, but one level is we get we get reports all the time about things being posted on Facebook or or elsewhere. But it seems to be a lot on Facebook um, of things that people feel are racist or anti-Semitic, and the the you know we we as you mentioned we have the First Amendment, and so if it isn't if it doesn't really rise to the level of a threat. Um, it's not really, it's probably not prosecutable. Um, and, and that's a horrible feeling for us to, to feel like we, we can't give a response. But that's when I would refer, if it wasn't already, to Tejash and say, you know, maybe there's something we can do here, or we would reach out to Scott and say, maybe there's, you know, if, if, if it's from a particular area or a particular school or something like that, um, and I, I don't think there's mandatory reporting from schools in this area. I think you're right, um, but maybe there should be, you know, but, but it's, it kind of goes in line with all of the um, initiatives that I know people are working on in terms of bullying, because it, it, in school, it can very much be one in the same. I mean, when we're talking about younger people in particular. Yes, good. Scott, do you have anything to add on this at this point? 
Um, you know, I think just in terms of, uh, of reporting, you know, for the schools, definitely if it's a no place for hate school, they're going to reach out to us because they see us as their, uh, as their conduit. I think it's, it's really important. I think there, there are a lot of distinctions here made between uh, hate crimes and hate incidents. Uh, ADL kind of becomes a bit of a one-stop shop because uh, we'll work with the school, we'll work with whoever it is, the parents, whoever is reporting this, to figure out what's best, what the, what the best next step is. Is the best next step to go to, to the social media company? Is it to go to the principal? Is it to go to law enforcement? You know, whatever it is, we become a kind of an easy way. But I will say, ADL takes the lead when it comes to anti-Semitism, but there are uh, broader issues of hate here. So that reporting form is, is uh, mostly used for issues of anti-Semitism. Yes, and I, I so appreciate, Scott, you know, from my perspective that ADL has this historically broad approach to anti-Semitism among other forms of hatred. And we've seen hatred across the board this year. My colleague, uh, John Liu, who chairs the Committee on New York City Schools with me, has been talking you know, significantly about anti-Asian violence this year, uh, in, in particularly in, in communities that he represents. And all of my colleagues uh, are struggling collectively to find the best legislative approach. It's not, it's not an easy thing to find the right course forward. But one interesting suggestion among the comments made here is telling some of the positive stories uh, of Jewish congregations, of Jewish generosity of spirit, which I feel very fortunate there's so much of. I noted recently that, for example, the collection of, of items for Afghan refugees that are being resettled in Westchester is largely being coordinated by the synagogues in Westchester as drop-off places for things for those who are going to be resettled here who, who don't have anything to start. That's one of the positive stories. and so. We have the challenge, we have to deal with a national rise in hatred and Scott and, and Mimi and Teja, thank you all for talking about it in that context. But also we have the opportunity to talk about these very positive things that you've talked about. Each of you has put a sol sort of a solution on the table, whether it's a no place for hate, which is one of many, I know. Teja, all the things you're doing to encourage the upstander and the interfaith work, which I honestly believe there's much greater opportunity to do that. I think we, we have a powerful tool in interfaith work and we should really expand on that. So I'm so pleased about that. And with the DA's very um, forward thinking way of complaining, even if it's not a crime, you can at least file a report with your office, right Mimi? And yeah. someone will get back to you and talk to you and you know give you the reassurance that you're being heard. Uh, we have, we have a way to go. We are, I, I think we're all very dissatisfied with the extent of anti-Semitism. We're committed to finding longer term solutions. I hope that anyone who is listening has constructive solutions to put on the table, whether they're legislative or executive actions that the attorney general or the DA can take, or that the county executive can take, or that ADL should consider please make sure to email me directly and we will share them. Um, my sense is I would like to do this again um, and you know, in several months and sort of see if in Westchester we're moving in the right direction. Uh, certainly COVID created a very unfortunately fertile climate for hate. And um, maybe as we come out of it, it will diminish, but we can't allow it to just be on its own. We have to constructively actually engage in pushing back and fighting against it. So I want to thank my, I'm sorry it's only an hour, my fantastic, very distinguished guests, my two interpreters. Thank you so much, Maria and Karen, courtesy of the New York State Senate, who understand how important it is that we communicate with everyone. Thank you to my staff for helping coordinate this. And thank you to Scott Richmond, Tejas Sanchala, getting it right and Mimi Roca, our district attorney. Thank you all so very much for participating in this important, very timely conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye all. Bye-bye.